Good morning, watchers. Welcome to Brother Sal, Sunday gathering at the storehouse. So happy to be here once again. Picked up Tony the other day, so he's with me uh, for the first time in a couple of months. And uh, we just haven't stopped talking about the uh, situation in the world and analyzing everything for the last two days. So uh, I'd like to welcome him to the show. Welcome to the show, Tom. Thanks, Dad. Good morning. And uh, don't exactly know what you're going to uh, talk about. What are you going to well, you know, I, I like to look through all the news every week, especially the mainstream news, to see what the propaganda headline is. And then this week, um, I've got another sort of piece of journalism that, well, it's just an interview, but it, I think it sheds a lot of light on the perspective that we're trying to present, you know, that alternative perspective that that there's something, the, the real story is not the the story that's talked about and seen and accepted by the masses. And I, you know, I, I suppose it's important to keep underlying these discussions with that context because I find, I mean, what I feel I can help share with people is that everybody's looking to, to decipher what's coming over the news. But if you don't have a context that underlies that, it's a constant, you know, uh, contradiction, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's one misnomer after another. And so no matter which side you're on, it's, it's basically a dead end. It's a wild goose chase. It's a, it's a bunch of facts that don't get you anywhere, but still keep you enslaved to the same destiny. So having a context for putting the pieces in place won't change that destiny, but it'll change your personal view of it the way you and I are able to look at these things and and not feel all the pull of the modern uh, you know not modern but the, the contemporary uh, uh, mainstream attitudes mm -hmm. whatever they are on whoever side whether it's Tea Party this or you know neocon that or Zionist this or whoever's up in arms about what you know, we're, we've got a context and you know that I shared an article, an interview with you this week from the Sheikh Imran Hossein recently over there in Eastern Europe in uh, Orthodox Christianity in Belgrade, a Muslim scholar trying to explain the affinity between Islamic eschatology and, uh, and, and the, well, explaining to Christians that in Islamic scripture in the Quran, it declares that in these end days that they that they acknowledge and identify as the end times, the people that would be closest to the Muslims in love and affection would call themselves Christians. And they'd be of a certain type of Christian that descended from a monastic, un, um, a, a non-arrogant sort of platform they'd be the ser you know servers mm -hmm. you know if you can think of the francis of assisi mm -hmm. and the monks that went around the philadelphian church well right in our parlance yeah. the philadelphian church and so that's in their quran you know you don't hear about it as a christian especially in this modern world of propaganda mm -hmm. you, you hear only the opposite you hear how the muslims want to take over the world how it's in their quran to jihad to what we talk about, I forget the word, hijaj, the trap, the, the emigration to spread. When we read about that a few weeks ago. Um, you know, all these things that have been misrepresented just like they have in Christianity, and we've been getting underneath all that in the connecting the dots and who's pulling the strings. And, you know, so I don't want to have to repeat everything every week. You know, I figure it's there. You know, this is where we're coming from. Mm -hmm. we're, we're undermining a lot of this mainstream concept of this Russian American, you know, America's just stumbling through this ISIS thing, taken completely by surprise. Of course, we're just trying to do the right thing. That's why NATO went in and destroyed Libya and the, and the great uh, fresh water, you know, the river project that he built that was bringing water from primary water source down below the earth's crust up into a, uh, a river of concrete tubes that they built to cross 4,000 kilometers of desert to bring water to 
places in Africa that didn't have any. So they could start growing crops. I mean, think what a lucrative and, 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 and uh, what was a humanitarian effort, right? One of the first things NATO did when they went to Libya is bomb that thing, destroyed that river. Can you imagine? It's a, I've read it a little bit. I mean, it just seems like a great war crime. But anyway, so these are things you're not told. You know, this isn't part of our narrative of Libya. But when you listen to Sheikh Imran Hossein, when you listen to some of, you know, of the people who are not in the spotlight, people like us, right? And I'm only getting it secondhand. I'm relating the things I'm learning because we study eschatology. Mm -hmm. If you want the firsthand look at Daniel Revelation, we've got, you know, I can't find anybody else that understands it better than we do. And that's why I encourage people to study the Bible at our Bible study. I wish we were getting 5,000 views at our Bible study because um, that's where we're really got something unique to share with people. It's our insight through the scriptures mm -hmm. that's given us the, the, the view of the geopolitical world that we're, that I try and share. Mm -hmm. Because uh, those scriptures, <clears throat> because the geopolitical uh, position that the world is in and has come to be in is the perfect match or per the, the scriptures are the perfect description of that. So they lead you into more insight than any kind of media, whatever. Well, and this is a, I, I suppose it's a good point to make that for me anyway, dad, I've come to learn that for you and I, that's true for people that have studied it all their life. And even people that have a different story, you know, I've come across people that have a fantastic way of explaining Daniel as, as, as pertaining to the King of England being the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. Have a fantastic way of explaining Daniel as pertaining to 490 days of end time prophecy. Have a fantastic way of explaining Daniel uh, like Michael Rood as, as being uh, part of the three and a half uh, years of Jesus ministry, all this kind of thing. Uh, I'm sorry, Michael Rood talks against that. The people that claim that part of Daniel has to do with Jesus' ministry being three and a half years. And he tries to point out, well, wait a minute, Jesus didn't have a three and a half year ministry. Michael Rood points out it was a 70 week ministry. Mm -hmm. So all these ways of seeing Daniel mm -hmm. and everybody that sees it that way really has a historical record that works for them. Mm -hmm. So what's unique about us from what I can tell is we have as what Dr. Dorothy Terry identified all those years ago the most biblically accurate mm -hmm. you know our story fits the whole of scripture more appropriately when I look at it all now mm -hmm. and, and, and that's why the insight I really have to share beyond just I really want to sh give what I think is some insight on the reading the news because I still feel that that's a big wall to break down. People imagine that if they read it in the New York Times, it has credibility. And the only credibility it has is, is the history being written by the victor, as Churchill said. You know, this is, this is what's going on. These people are rewriting history where they're good and benevolent. But history proves, you know, it has a whole different world to offer of facts. You know, historical facts that are every bit as historical as the Golden Gate Bridge. It's pretty hard to argue that they built something that we call the Golden Gate Bridge to span that gap of water. I mean, it's been there now for a generation. You pay a toll to go over it. There's a, a, work, a crew of workmen that never stopped 365 days a year maintaining it. You know, it's a, it's a historical fact, mm -hmm. whether you want to admit it or not, whether you want to... You know, however you want to frame that in your philosoph philosophical or metaphysical outline, it happens to be a fact. So there's some things in history it's really hard to argue without undermining everything and just being a babbling, you know, might as well be a drooling, babbling, you know, someone in an insane asylum. If you can't admit any history, well then, how do you even know you're a you? And, oh yeah, so they're so happy to say that. But what makes you so happy? Where does your confidence come from? Confidence rests on some foundation that things have a certain uh, uh, context in which you are 
in touch with. That's what gives you the confidence. You know, I feel like I'm standing straight up and I'm in line with gravity. If I found out that I was supposed to be on my head, it would be quite a shock to find out I've become comfortable upside down. Right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have to, to have confidence means you have some idea of what things ought to be so that you're confident you're adhering, you know, and that's, that's very, you know, the modern day has made that like sort of this silly old fashioned way of looking at things. And it's funny because all the people who spent their lives thinking about reality, confronted with reality, not plastic reality, not cyberspace, not, you know, the, the kinds of things that make us numb to the real seasons passing, the planting and reaping seasons of food, the way the moon goes through its cycle and is brighter in sometimes the years. And, you know, all, all the things that are really sort of were meaningful to humans throughout their history have become meaningless to us, you know, but we know what night the Academy Awards are on and who won, right? And what the, what the new fashion color is for the year. And, you know, we know all these re absurd facts and think we're so advanced. But when you look at, you know, what's always been understood from Confucius, you know, the harmony of things without a God, without having to bring it to a religious level, there would just appear to be this harmony and it goes back thousands of years. And so this sort of thing gives us a, a picture of reality beyond what they tell us in these stories. This is what I keep trying to get at this foundation that if you could, if you could get your mind around a foundation of history and a reality beyond the stories they're telling you, you could start fitting the stories in, how, how they fit, like the Kennedy assassination of its time, like 9-11 of our time, mm -hmm. like whatever's coming to bring us to the war of the future. So my insight is really that because of our scripture and what we know, I say all this is the propaganda setting things up and we're not so close. As, as they're making you know, World War Three, the takeover of the Muslims, you know, all this stuff that they're hyping every day, mm -hmm. taking our guns because of all this, you know, these things are being set up for some years in the future because we know there's a seven year covenant out of Daniel. Mm -hmm. And and that seven year covenant ends in what we imagine to be this Armageddon, what we call Armageddon, the, right? We know at least that the first three and a half years they rebuild the temple because they don't have it now and they start worshiping because they're not worshiping now and we know that that's what happens in the middle of the week he breaks the covenant stops the worship mm -hmm. well they're not worshiping now so you know it only stands to reason as we've always thought and as many people recognize that this seven-year covenant must start with some ability for the Jews to restart, you know, and they're ready to build their temple. They seem to be have the word already from the last 15, 20 years that they're going to do it because mm -hmm. they've got everything lined up, including the heifers to slaughter and all the implements and training the priests. And so that you could say that they'd be doing that even if it was 100 years off. So, yes, that is not hard evidence, but it's it couldn't be happening, as you've always said, if it wasn't the case. So the fact is they are ready to rebuild the temple now. And until they do, we haven't started, you know, until that seven year clock starts, we're not even to the midpoint that kicks off the hostility that brings on the great war. A time of trouble is never seen. So what we're seeing now is not that, and it can't be that. And, and I want to keep bringing up what Jesus told the Jews Wars and rumors of wars, right? When in in uh, in the Gospels, there when they're asking him, "What's the signs of your coming?" and the and the and the end of all these things that you've been talking about, and he said there'll be wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and volcanoes and diverse. But don't get alarmed; these are only the beginning. So isn't that interesting? He didn't say, "Hey, when you see these things, run for the hills," did he? No, he said, when you see the abomination spoken of by Daniel, why? Because you still got three and a half years, you know, through, you know, by a very basic calendar of saying seven year covenant, middle of the covenant, they break the peace uh, or whatever the temple agreement. I, I don't want to call it a peace anymore. We, you know, that's another insight we have that, that I think needs to be shared. Uh, the, the seven year covenant isn't a necessarily a peace covenant. We assume that because of this white horse. But as the Quran teaches, 
That symbolism symbolizes a righteous ruler. This ruler that a crown is given to that he doesn't earn in battle. Mm -hmm. So that says righteous ruler and that righteous ruler goes out conquering and to conquer. He doesn't say the righteous ruler, you know, sets up peace. We've always just assumed the white horse meant peace and was a symbol of peace. But I, I think it's safe to at least consider that the, the, the people who teach uh, Muslim eschatology through the Quran may be right because they're reading the same scripture they're interpreting Revelation. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're saying that this means a righteous ruler that's going to be given a crown because of his righteousness and he'll go out fighting a good fight mm -hmm. against oppression. And so, um, you know, it may be that we misunderstand some of these horses of Revelation, but what we can't misunderstand is the clarity of Daniel about a covenant that will be made with many and in the midst of the weak, mm -hmm. right? So that's pretty clear. And then you have this other delineations of the three and a half years by the days, 1260 days. You know, you have enough information there to really see this period of time of seven years. And when you figure in the way we've always understood the 70 weeks of years of Daniel, to be 69 until the Messiah that was cut off. And because that last week dealt with the final uh, redemption of these this, these Jews that he divorced, that he kicked out, that he said, no more, you're off this land, right? Uh, I'll, build, I'll make my word good now through the world. I'll use Paul to teach the world that I've got a bigger plan than you killing my Messiah, oh darn, for me. I've got a bigger, better plan, and that's what's going to happen, but I'll, I'm reserving this one week to come back to you, this seven-year period. And that's the way we've always seen it, and I haven't read, I haven't seen anything to, that, 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 that to me convinces me that there's a better argument yet, a more thorough argument. There's a lot of flashy arguments, there's a lot of possible arguments, but it seems to me quite plausible in the entire Word of God that what we're dealing with is this seven year period that satisfies this final time for the Jews to do what it says in Isaiah. Mm -hmm. Seal up the most holy place in the vision and prophecy, anoint the most holy place, seal up vision and prophecy. Those things that didn't get finished in Isaiah when Jesus closed the book, you know. He said, you know, you, the, the first part of the prophecy is fulfilled in your ears, to, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Um, and heal the sick and broken hearted. So th th now I've, I've, I've done this. So we, Christians have always sort of understood that. And when he comes again, he'll satisfy the other. But how does he, you know, Christians imagine he's satisfying the other for them. But wait a minute, the Christians, new creatures, you accept it. That's it. It's a spiritual thing. God's in your heart. It's a whole you and God from here on out. You, Jesus, and God, and the Holy Spirit. There is no intermediary after that. It's between you and him. You guys are working out your salvation through fear and trembling of his power to send you to Ghana, which we teach about. Because he can you know, fear the power that could do that. No, no actual promise that that's what he's going to do to anybody. And if you don't want to, you know, please study with us on our Bible study, or at least review some of the heaven and hell teachings, because, you know, that's what... All of this for me is leading toward an understanding of the scripture and a scripture that doesn't say believe in Jesus or go to hell. So we study that in the, in the Bible, what doesn't say. But in this show, you know, we're looking at the geopolitical and how the prophecies come into, to bear on things. And that I started by deferring to Imram Hussein, the, mm -hmm. the, the interview I sent you, where the sheiks is telling this Christian interviewer in Belgrade, um, that when he, he, get, he asked him about the geopolitical situation and how does he see the world and how does this play out and what's the meaning of things going on. And Sheikh Hossein says, you know, only Christian eschatology and Islamic eschatology can give you the insight nowadays to, to make those questions answerable. If you don't understand what scripture says about the final days, you can't unravel it strictly through the geopolitical landscape being presented by the media or any particular viewpoint, mm -hmm. see, on, on that level. If you don't understand that it's heading toward something that's been outlined in these scriptures, 
that's playing out even in spite of the rational course of things, in spite of all of the, you know, uh, seemingly on the surface elements of power and and uh, manipulation, right? So, you know, and, and through the Islamic eschatological view, they see it as Dajjal, the false messiah of the Jews, that God let loose to do the thing he's got to do. And this the Christians call Antichrist, and which is said from all the way back in our earliest scriptures, the spirit of Antichrist is already at work. So it's been acknowledged as something in the world at work for 2,000 years, and through the Quranic scriptures in their way, same person, false messiah. Now, Dajjal, the false messiah of the Jews, same person, funny enough, that they're seeing. And he's been at work since God let him out. They see, they see Dajjal as coming out of England and America, that that's when it let loose sort of this empire of England that took over the world to reestablish the false Jews in that land for the false Messiah to take over and rule. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's his take on it. And it's, boy, he knows his history and it's, he's a wonderful person to study with. Doesn't understand my perspective of not all believers are burning in hell forever. I mean, I, I differ with him on that. He, you know, he thinks gays are obviously going to hell. I mean, you can't even live in a country or tolerate a country in his view that would allow that. But of course, that just shows you culturally why someone like Paul would say that he can't tolerate a woman without a veil over her face, right? I don't see Christianity sticking to Paul that close. Right, Paul said, a "Woman's shame." You know, it's a, it's a, um, a, 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 you know, a, a degradation to her to cut her hair, or a man to grow his hair. Right, a woman to be seen in public without her, with her face uncovered, a woman to go to church, and all these things. I mean, come on, can't you see that as you know the cult, the cultural, uh, the cultural imperative of Paul's day. Uh, playing out so I see that in the sheik you know he's a Muslim this is the way they grew up so just like Christianity and I tell you that's why I'd love to see people get involved in the Bible study because I want to hear the arguments come on bring them on bring on the intelligent Christians that can prove Jesus sending everybody to hell uh, but meanwhile let's look at what's going on in the world this week Dan with that sort of introduction I want to uh, compare some things here the first one from yesterday, Saturday, out of uh, a source, I'm not sure of, but the, it just says ZY here, I am, I'm really, I get this through my Yahoo mail, and I've, I've decided that from, from all the stuff I look at, that they represent the, you know, the mouthpiece stuff, I mean, it's all the same story. So here's the story this week. This one's by John McLaughlin, who some people might remember. The author was deputy director and acting director of the CIA from 2000 to 2004 and currently teaches at the John Hopkins School of, of Advanced International Studies. Imagine what you got to pay to send your kid there to learn from this guy. And what are you going to learn, I wonder? This is what I want, you know, if I'm not getting people that are on this sort of track, then geez, I must be really freaking people out as it just some sort of nutball. But come on, this guy is as straight, I mean, this is as straight to the, to the uh, official. This is the official word, man. This guy from the CIA. I mean, he was in the CIA, so... Right? This is our learned scholar, learned statesman, inside man for four years. I mean, close enough to the inside to be the deputy director and acting director of the CIA. I mean, does he just, do you just run for coffee? I mean, what, I don't know exactly what the job description is, but I'll bet you got to get some pretty good security clearance to get it. That's who this guy is. And here's his take on what's going on in the world, right? Which is what... I've been saying is impossible. Okay, so, and I'm just going to read a little bit of this article down a couple of paragraphs because it's not long. All the stuff in this kind of Yahoo uh, mouthpiece articles, 
Only a few of them give you like 2,500 words so you could get some maps and sink your teeth in to some what you think is detail. But these kind, now uh, these are, you know, in and out. This is soundbite world for people that just want to get all the news and a thousand words or less. So here's what the deputy, former deputy and acting director of the CIA from 15, 10, 10, 15 years ago has to say, and a current teacher at the John Hopkins Advanced School of Advanced International Studies. It's been three weeks of watching Vladimir Putin begin to make his mark on the situation in Syria. Although it's still early days, we can already see hints of how his moves are complicating U.S. calculations, changing the force balance in Syria and dividing the region. So people who are listening to me know that I've been trying to point out that it seems pretty odd, not only that Russia has such a capacity in the last 20 years since they were dead broke, and we broke them and the oligarchs stole all the money, and you'd think since they were our arch enemy, we, you know, we wouldn't just sit back and let them rearm. We'd have put some sort of, hey, wait a minute, we're not, hey, Russia's starting to get a, you know, they're, they're halfway to our military capacity. Maybe we should start talking about you know, if we're going to let Russia keep up, but no, I, I don't remember hearing a thing except all of a sudden, bang, Russia. And so now, now that we know they're so great, we don't anticipate they're going to flex their muscle and come into Syria. That's what it keeps sounding like. And this John Hopkins, you know, former CIA, he, you watch how, what he thinks about ISIS. He doesn't seem to talk about them being funded by the CIA or anything. They just seem to be this legitimate rebel group. I mean, no one in the serious alternative media even considers that anymore. How could you not at least include that in your argument that you have to justify these sort of people? So I'd like to read a couple paragraphs to set this stage before I go to something that might, that you, you see immediately has more value to you as, as revealing facts of history. So this guy's pointing out that it's only been three weeks watching old Putin make his mark in Syria. Something that's just complicating U.S. calculations because darn it, we, we didn't think, I mean, just because Russia's as big as we are and has all the interest in the world in Syria, we didn't think they'd do anything. I mean, we're not talking to them, they're not talking to us, but shoot, why would they do anything? They've just been building weapons every day for the last 20 years. Syria holds, I'm going back to the article now, Syria holds grave risks for anyone who touches it Putin's situation does not yet feel like the quagmire, quote, U.S. officials have been asserted he is heading into. To be sure, outsiders like Putin can always get sucked into civil wars, but for now, he is deploying small numbers, several thousand military personnel, and several dozen combat aircraft and other weaponry, which he can easily withdraw if need be. Putin is projecting the image of a realist who knows how to use power. His argument is simple. A weaker Assad regime would leave little standing in the way of an, of an Islamic State takeover. So we have watched him maneuver to give Assad some breathing space. Putin's first moves have been to alleviate pressure on Syria, bombing mostly the regime's non-IS opponents and coordinating with Iran, which is carrying the burden of combat support for Assad. Now, there's only another paragraph or so I want to read, but I want to break this one down for a minute, Deb, because I, I feel like, wait a minute, is someone, you know, something is hurting my back end here. I don't feel right about what they're saying. Syria holds grave risks for anyone who touches it. Putin's situation does not yet feel like the quagmire U.S. officials have asserted he is heading into. Yeah, well, that's just. Well, no, wait a minute. They knew. How, where'd they get that from, Dad? How many, is this just a three-week-old situation? Now that now it's a quagmire for him, but it wasn't a quagmire for us. But we never thought he'd come because we never counted on the fact that we you know we never even figured that into it. Now we're scratching our heads, but now we already know it's a quagmire for him. We're a week ago, weren't they applauding? Wasn't he just bombing ISIS and blowing them off the street? I mean, how do we know what to believe? Is what I'm. You know, here's. I guess what I'm hoping to give insight rather than just reading these silly articles and hoping other people will start to get it. There must be a story that's really true and going on in which some of these facts have some bearing. 
Putin probably really is the president of Russia. Seems like it. Just like Obama seems like he's the president of America. They told us we elected him. He seems to be on TV every day. I mean, you know, he's the one giving the speeches. So I ask you, does that mean when the paper says Obama decides to leave troops in Afghanistan, that Obama was hanging out in front of the TV watching, you know, the, some sort of movie with Michelle and the kids, thinking it over. Should I leave troops in Afghanistan, Michelle? Yeah, honey, why not? You know, those son of a guns, they make a lot of heroin. Go get them, baby. Leave the troops. I'm all for it. That's what we'll do, honey. Okay, I'm going to go sign an executive order tomorrow. And we're leaving the troops. Do you really believe it's Obama's? Is he at home deciding whether we leave troops in Afghanistan? He's deciding. Obama. He's out on the golf course thinking, should I leave the troops or should I bring them home? That's my decision. I'm going to decide and that will be the law of the land. I mean, does anyone get it? Is he a figurehead that they put on TV that someone can shoot at? And it won't really change the policies. Does anyone get that? They can blow his head off tomorrow and the next idiot scarecrow like Hillary Clinton or, or any of them. Any of them. Pick one of these idiot scarecrows because they don't give you anything else. They give you morons willing to get their head shot off to lie to you so that the policies go on. Now, who is the policy makers? Come on, you guys. You really think it's Obama and Putin? Putin's doing the same thing in Russia. Yeah, I think we go to Syria. I've decided. Yeah, I've decided. Putin's doing But don't they talk about it that way? Even a guy like this, who's behind Putin? Who's telling Putin, I think we should spend all this money to get into this potential quagmire in, and go against potential U.S. interests and maybe get and start World War III? This is what we ought to do, Putin. Who's telling him the way we know somebody's telling Obama? But yet, is that the way it's represented, Dad, ever? Putin does this, right? China's just China. Like, they act like a, like a, a, a map that you see on the map. They just, they're, they're just a map with a voice. We're China. This is what we're doing. Right? Like, the, who has the investments in? Who owns China? Do we ever hear about that? Isn't that interesting? Does anyone know England conquered China? You know, British Empire. Anybody know why China makes all the plastic crap? And, and, and why their workers make a dollar a day and we make, you know, a hundred a day over the years? You know, why, why their children, we, you know, why uh, human rights groups had to go stop them from working their children in factories from our U.S., you know, manufacturers, but them allowing them to work their children in the factories. Do we have that problem? Did we, do we have that problem in America? So I'm wondering, who's the country that's got all the money? China, really? They're, they're the ones with all the money and power, huh? Since, I mean, show me where they took it back from the English Empire. Oh, Gen the General Mao, Cultural Revolution, huh? Communist Revolution. Who funded the communists? Raise your hand, Christians, anybody know? Who funded the communists to go kill all the Orthodox Christians? Right? Who funded the Ottoman Empire? To go kill all the Orthodox Christians? Anybody know? You know? Vatican rings a bell. So, people don't know their history, so they don't know the context, Dad. Mm -hmm. They don't understand where we're coming out of. So, Putin's calling the shots for Russia, huh? He just says, yeah, this is what we're doing. We're going to war, just like Obama. So, it's Putin and Obama and China. China from a map on a screen. There's no human beings with investment in China who are pulling strings in China to tell their president who dresses in a tie and comes from now some sort of weird parliamentary system when these people descend from thousands of years of, <laughs> of, of emperors and a spiritual background of real metaphysical and, and philosophical knowledge. So what do they coincidentally have? A cultural revolution where they kill all those people, that have, the philosophers, right? And, and, and shame them and put them to work in the fields and try and change the culture from thinkers to non-thinkers. Yeah, probably was the people who, you know, uh, I mean, the people did that to themselves. That's what they wanted. Really? Where'd they get the money to do that? And become this from the communists, of course, from Russia. Oh, okay. There you go. That's right. So trace it back. Where'd they get the money to overthrow the Orthodox Christianity there? So, 
You know, until you start connecting those dots, you can't bring it forward into the modern day and see who might be pulling these strings. So now let's get back to, you know, Putin making his mark and here. Putin, not explaining to you these journalists, wait a minute, who does Putin work for? Who are the people that are so anxious to put the Russian military at odds against the American military? Knowing that this is the quagmire, everybody's been talking quagmire for 20 years, it seems to be the word. I mean, it's not like just us conspiracy nuts are throwing it around. This is the Dick Cheney word from 94, the quagmire that would result over there, the refugee crisis that would result the vacuum, the unfillable vacuum, except through extremism, which they all predicted. So what's the big surprise of well, any of this? The thing that really gets me the most is that they were already selling it as a quagmire in 94. And they brought it about. And well, because it was a different... See, the reason in 94 was different than the reason... See, I see it as a trigger that's been waiting to be pulled, but the pieces weren't in place. You know, and that's what these wars were about in the beginning. Mm -hmm. The one against Iran to get arms over there into Iraq in the first place, to make a reasonable case, to have a base, to have some people to protect Israel, to protect the Sunnis' moderate interests from the Shia, you know, make them out to be all a bunch of crazies after the Iranian Revolution, when they got tired of having a terrorist, a U.S.-supported terrorist as a president that was slaughtering anybody, like kind of like Mao. Anybody that wanted freedom or intelligence or to, you know, speak out, you know, in any kind of, you know, academic way was killed, absolutely, you know, silenced. So this is the method. It's so easy to see, to imagine that this was the popular uprising. You only have to do a little history study to see that's not true. So we've been over that. Go back and watch the last few weeks or the last several months, I guess, if you want to, if you want to get off everybody else's channel and get onto a different channel. And so... What I'm trying to say is, it's interesting to me, Putin is projecting the image of a realist who knows how to use power. His, his argument is simple. See, Putin, 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 as if this is speaking for what interest? How come we never have at least a delineation? Putin is speaking for this particular interest who feels it's worth making these moves because. No, it's just like, a, like reading a children's book. Like Putin's a little god on his little throne and just like Obama. That's the way they make it out to us, okay? So we've watched him maneuver. So we have, it says, so we've watched him maneuver to give Assad some breathing space. Putin's first moves have been to alleviate pressure on Syria, bombing mostly the regime's non-IS opponents and coordinating with Iran, which is carrying the burden of ground combat support for Assad. Now, there's a couple of points I see immediately here. First of all, back to the, you know, what's, what are we doing with all our bases, all our intelligence? You know, again, we didn't anticipate so that we didn't lose any ground. If Russia wanted to come in, well, yeah, we, we're already, you know, you're going to face more firepower than you were expecting since you've only sent... So what does it say here? Several thousand military personnel and several dozen combat aircraft. Well, we're the great United States of America, aren't we? 1,400 military bases. I mean, you mean we can't at least match it? <laughs> you know, we, we can't at least anticipate what would Russia send on if, the, if Russia were by chance to be so silly as to get involved in Syria. Well, we'd want them to see that we were pretty well prepared, wouldn't we? But were we now? Nah, we're oh shoot! It's thrown off our couch. What does it start out we with? We came out pretending like we couldn't figure out. Well, we have all. I've been pointing this out for months. That's why I encourage people to go back and listen to some of the other shows. Yeah. And it's it for me. This isn't all just a, every week. We're like these silly news shows. We're putting it together the whole story as it's growing underneath us, in front of us, and you know I've been saying this for weeks and weeks and weeks and months that this is the case uh, with this whole Assad thing and all of this, this ISIS stuff that it's impossible to think that with our intelligence, the Mossad's intelligence, Egypt where we've been for all these years, Jordan where we've been, 
you know, the ally for a whole generation. I mean, literally, all these kids, these Arabs that grew up, they grew up in a whole generation where the Mossad and Jordan and Egypt and Saudi Arabia have ruled that land with American uh, proxy rulers and American support. So it's really unthinkable that they have some sort of network that nobody's aware of or can get underneath. I mean, you know, it, it, it's, it's quite unthinkable. And so, and I was pointing out for months ago that Islamic State, when it was so manageable, should have been, you know, easy to throw a net around then, or at least to make moves now, start anticipating. Why wouldn't you know the sort of areas they're going to head for next and get some military over there. We got 14. The biggest military base America has in the world is in Iraq. So we have more than enough probably to have, you know, stopped ISIS, if that was for real, in its tracks, you know, in the first 30 days of that, that little movement. So all of this has to be seen in some sort of context. And I'm saying, here you go with a CIA guy and his propaganda is so thick, it's like, you know, I have to wear something over my nose just to read this to you, you know. Um, although it's still early days, we can already see hints of how his moves are complicating U.S. calculations, changing the force balance. And this is where I want to go with all this, that we're setting up these wars and rumors of wars to get more and more military equipment there for something that's going to be much bigger than what might happen in the next year. Mm -hmm. um, so this is where I'm trying to go. And now here's an interesting little thing that uh, I find in this story. Putin's first moves have been to alleviate pressure on Syria, bombing mostly the regime's non-ISIS opponents and coordinating with Iran, which is carrying the burden of ground combat support for Assad. I mean, I hope I don't have to read that any slower or simpler, but I will. Coordinating with Iran, this is Putin's first moves. They're alleviating pressure on Syria. No specifics there. What in the world does that mean? Bombing mostly the regime's non IS opponents which other people show you uh, hardly exist. There is hardly anybody there. They've all joined IS. They're the ones with the big guns from America. You know, they're, they're the people, the little rebels on the side with the pitchforks. They're joining, you know, if they want to fight the regime, they're joining IS to do it. And that's what all the alternative people are showing that there's really only one force that has any momentum in the region. And that is the whole Islamic state movement. So these little rebel forces, you know, uh, don't have any, power whatsoever, as we saw when IS routed them off the safe zone that the U.S. and Turkey couldn't seem to maintain through these rebels. So there, that's why in other articles are trying to say that's all Russia's really hitting. They're hitting some, and they're not really. Where a week ago they were, oh boy, they're doing what we couldn't do. Right? All different conflicting stories, see, to keep to keep all the stories alive. But I, this is what I want to point out in this one that, you know, People should think about it. Made me think. Putin's first moves have been to alleviate pressure on Syria, bombing mostly regimes non-IS opponents, which means what the the people that couldn't even keep a safe zone from IS in the first place. So who's you know? The, the, so think about that second part of the sentence and coordinating with Iran, which is carrying the burden of ground combat support for Assad, which is carrying the burden of ground combat support for Assad. Now let's go to another article. Iran sends fighters to Syria escalating its involvement from the 14th. This is just a couple of days before. I guess this is what they're referring to. This is the ground support, right? Holy mackerel. To take on the U.S. Army and its allies, what do you got to do? Well, let's see. How many they send it? The official who has deep knowledge of operational details in Syria said the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, currently numbering about 1,500, began arriving about two weeks ago after the Russian airstrikes began and have accelerated recently. That's 1,500. 
Does that sound like an insurmountable amount of ground support? I mean, if I found, you know, it sounds like something Napoleon could handle with his army, right? 1,500? 1, shoot, shoot, give me 10,000 men. Let's go over there and just, you know, give, in fact, give me 20,000 and let's just stand in front of them and, you know, say, come on, let's have tea. Let's not do this, right? So I find this a little absurd. You know, Russia sent 7,000 and several. Iran sent 1,500. And boy, we're perplexed. Oh, what do we do? I mean, you figure Israel's got 10,000 guys ready to go kill people every minute of every day. I mean, you know, I just don't get it. How many? 1,500? I mean, if you said they sent 150,000 ground troops, I'd go, oh, gosh. Ooh, yeah, oh, gosh. You know, we got... You know, this this is scary. 150,000 Iranians are flooding into Syria. This is scary. So I say watch out because I, I think maybe that's what's coming. I mean, that's where they have to really build to because 1,500 sounds like you're just trying to sell me newspapers over this. What's 1,500? I mean, there's, there's bands in Southern California. You know, there's college bands that have 1,500 members. There's a horn section, I think, at UCLA that's got, you know, almost that many members. This just doesn't sound right. We could send a couple of college gymnastics teams over there to kick these guys' butts. They'd outnumber them five to one. So it just doesn't make sense. 1,500, huh? Ooh, the ground support. So this is two days before the article, you know, the Putin... Uh, from this director, and this guy, like you say, this is ex-deputy director, acting director, John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. I mean, this is, you know, like I say, how much does it cost to send your kid to go learn from him? And what's he telling you? You know, he's feeding us full of this son of a gun. So, um, I think that there's one more important paragraph here. But the limited nature of Putin's first steps and his calm justifications don't mean the U.S.-led coalition likes much of what's at play, and certainly not the human rights abuses of Putin's barrel-bombing ally, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. Okay, so here's an academic talking like an idiot, right? We know we got caught accusing him of using chemical weapons when we know it was the rebels. The whole world caught us. Right. So this guy, all of a sudden, like, wow, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't spend five cents to let my kid go listen to this diarrhea of the mouth. Right. Human rights abuses of Bashar al-Assad. Yeah. We're the guys that you know, claim weapons of mass destruction. We're the guys that go in and rebuild the heroin fields. We're the guys that drop our own buildings on 9-11 to get into the war. I mean, come on. This is to pretend that all that at least isn't a question. That all that stuff isn't on the table is is you you have to see that as pure propaganda nonsense. So so here's the last part. Unless we think Putin is unless we think Putin simple, he is motivated by more than shoring up his ally and protecting his country's Mediterranean naval base at Tardis. Russians remember all too well the denouncement of the Balkan crisis in the late 1990s when NATO operations knocked out their Serbian ally. Slobodan Milosevic, in other words, when NATO screwed him out of a country, he's now got an axe to grind and fashioned a settlement that left Moscow no voice. Putin is determined that such a settlement not take place again, and he surely realizes one is inevitable in the region. If he could prop up Assad for a while, the dictator will never again rule all of Syria. Putin knows this and is betting that his military presence facts on the ground and diplomatic parlance will assure him an influential seat in the eventual bargaining over the future of Syria. So what I see he, we can get out of him is the fact that he's planting this deeper MO. Putin saw what happened in the Balkans and how they stole uh, that Serbian property from him. <laughs> And so he's got something to protect here to get a chip in the game, which to me says a reason to keep building military presence, which is what I'm anticipating. This isn't going to resolve. It's just going to, it may resolve in ceasefires and we're talking, but what you'll find 
that all the alternative media people will be reporting is while they're talking, everybody's building up weapons, moving weapons, right? What's one of the other articles this week, Dad? India, U.S., and Japan hold naval exercises under China's gaze, right? So all these, you know, war maneuvers, again, during the peace process, you know, all the peace process, peace process, and all this over what? Syria, who if we go back a few years, what in the world was so bad, you know, what, what he wanted a free election, just, you know, the last two. And, and none of the international people that look at that have been able, you know, associations have been able to really say anything. Nobody puts any, you know, you don't see that. You don't see that, hey, look at the facts. This guy killed people, stole the election. We can see that about Bush and Clinton and those people. I mean, you really can. You can dig it up about Lyndon Johnson and his involvement in Kennedy and those kind of things. But you don't see anybody point out any of that about Assad or, or Libya's Gaddafi or any of that, right? You just, you, I mean, I haven't. There's sure a lot of reason to, if that existed, to justify our history of military involvement. So instead, what do we have for justification? 9-11, an obvious inside job. We've got weapons of mass destruction, didn't exist. We got an Afghanistan war still goes on for no reason except it seems that heroin production's at an all-time high since we got back in there. So, you know, there's a lot of things that you don't have to decide on, but you don't have to close your mind to, to, get, to just start putting the pieces together on a deeper picture. So anyway, so yeah, you got, you know, this stuff going on in the, um, the Bay of Bengal. Carriers, submarines from U.S., India, and Japan steamed into the Bay of Bengal on Saturday as they took part in a joint military exercise off India's east coast, signaling the growing strategic ties among the three countries as they face up to a rising China. See, again, you know, I, I point out, it's pretty interesting to think of these guys taking on the money that built the British Empire and America, people who won the Second World War, the only superpower to ever exist. The people have been calling the shots, built the UN, have the, you know, <laughs> have been extorting the, the resources of the planet for a hundred years, put their money into Palestine and re repatriating that land for this idea of this Judaic Israel state and then have been supporting that state and its allies in that land through brutal dictators ever since. I mean, that's just a pretty simple history. Come on. Go ahead and refute that. Where's the re refutation of that in history? Except for these silly people like like this guy, this ex-CIA mouthpiece that gets his job to go teach diarrhea of history. So anyway, uh, some of the other headlines. Huffington Post, Russian cooperation with Iran and Iraq has broader consequences than saving Assad. Uh, again, bringing in this deeper uh, triangle of conflicting interests with America. See, all, all to me, strings being pulled to get all the weapons there on both sides. I don't have to go through all that art because I'm trying to get to something better if we have time. To, oh, we're, we're maybe not going to have time to. Putin, here's another article from the Fiscal Times on the 16th. Putin is learning a hard lesson in Syria but pretends easy victory. Again, they're, they're presenting now that Putin's finding out what we found out. Doing a lot of bombing won't do it. Got to get boots on the ground. Uh, in fact, it appears, I'm quoting now, in fact, it appears that the Kremlin is learning the same lesson the U.S. took away from its involvement in the Middle East. Air power alone won't tip the balance in a ground war. <laughs> Does that sound like one of these days we're going to read Iran sends 20,000 people, Russia UNLA, you know, is shipping 100,000 people, NATO needs to respond. I mean, I don't know. I'm just saying, you know, read what's really going on over there. It can't be what they're reporting on the surface. Um, nobody, you know, as if all these great military powers are just willing to go in and die on assumptions and misconceptions and second guesses and, right? All these strategists that are, you know, Let's face it, the Cold War we pretend was a bunch of generals keeping us from war by, by keeping that mutually assured destruction. I got your number. I'm spying on you. And you're spying on me. And because of that, neither of us can get away with anything. We both have to just keep on 
holding each other's, you know, we're, we're, we're like cuffed together in that way. And so it's hard to believe that these people who were such strategists at that time are just blundering idiots now. Only ISIS is the superior strategist now. And funny enough, his, you know, the second in command there, whatever we read a few weeks ago, he's a trained terrorist from the USA that was in Georgia terrorizing the Russians when we were trying to get that regime changed over to a favorable one. He was one of our terrorists, you know, so that's where he comes from. Now he's the big guy at ISIS, funny enough. But we wouldn't know, as I said before, who his contacts are, where he comes from, how to get to him. <laughs> he know he knows how to get to us. Well, it's obvious to me that what they're selling on the surface is nothing more than the story that's covering what's really going on. Here's another one, Vox World. Assad's first big Russia-backed campaign is not going well. So all of a sudden, it's funny because last week it was like... Uh, Everybody's applauding the saw. I mean, um, Putin. Russia's doing what we couldn't do. Was the big uh, uh, idea? At least the alternative. You know, I can't remember exactly all the mouthpiece. Blah blah blah. It's the same thing about Russia's building up. Russia, Russia, Russia. Well, it's, it's all a spin job. Well, no, I know, but I'm saying you have to. You, that's not sufficient to to know that it's a spin job because. Uh, as we, as I tried to talk about last week, I see, for me, I see it all as a, it's a, the whole world ocean is propaganda, and in that world ocean is every type. So the the type that seems anti-propaganda is also propaganda. Mm -hmm. In a, in a certain sense, even what we're saying is somebody's propaganda. It happens to be our own. It's our propaganda of trying to push our own vision of what the scriptures say, mm -hmm. right? But at least it's not Exxon's propaganda or Rothschild's propaganda or the bad. But the point is those people all have propaganda. You know, if you can trace the money and the interest and see what they say about themselves. And that's what the world's full of. So you can't, you know, where are you going to get your information? You, you've got to try and have, I say, you have to sift it for yourself based on a context that you understand history to be fitting into. Mm -hmm. And so, so I'm just seeing this, you know, constant from the emergence of ISIS being nothing but a picture of nothing, a flag, a person on an empty street with a flag. Never once have I seen anything but false images of these people, a, a gathering of a few people in the streets with masks on. I mean, nothing. It's like, it's like the old movie, Wag the Dog. There's nothing to substantiate this, these people at all. A few videos on YouTube, a few mouthpiece stories in the news as if they're so real. People like this guy we started with acting as if this is all so real without anyone having a historical background for it that makes any sense. And so I want to show how quickly that the headline shift. Last week, everybody was applauding Assad for... I mean, Putin for doing what we couldn't do. This week, they're pointing out, oh, boy, he's getting in a quagmire. Oh, boy, he's learning the hard way. Oh, boy, and now this one, Assad's first big Russia-backed campaign is not going well. In other words, even with Russia helping him, they're not getting back the territory they were hoping. See, what, what is it saying to me? N nothing's coming easy. It's all going deeper. So everybody's got to put up more because this ain't working. So what do they do? Run and hide? No, they got to put. Russia's going to have to send more. Iran's going to have to send more. That's going to get more dangerous for our interests. So we're going to have to respond. NATO, us, NATO, whatever, however that is sold to us. Uh, and then Turkey, another uh, Huffington Post. Turkey's unwillingness to take on ISIS has come back to haunt it. Right. So um, is this just pure propaganda uh, in the sense of scare? Propaganda, watch out for ISIS, they're everywhere. Uh, uh, is this pointed at certain individual interests in Turkey that refuse to put their money up from the people that are looking for money and military support uh, for this? And they said, we see through your bull. We're not doing it. Oh, okay. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I mean, come on, think of how the world works. Uh, I like to bring up the Nostradamus prophecy about the Peloponnesian penin Peninsula where Greece is, that he says a false dust will create a famine and pestilence for nine months. And a false dust doesn't mean volcano, there's a specific word. 
and it means something synthetic, something not real. It's not dust. It's, it looks like dust, but it's actually not dust at all. Um, and so, you know, what, what could that be? You know, biological warfare? You know, who knows? Uh, Greece happens to owe a lot of money to some people, and the people of Greece don't want to pay it. And uh, I've been saying this for months also, that they were going, you know, when all that was going on, everybody was saying, look at Greece, everybody should be like Greece, just say, you tell those bankers, get on your own money, you'll be fine. What was I saying, Dad? Yeah, sure you will. Sure, you're just going to tell the creditors, five billion in interest, shove it up your butt. We're not paying. Oh, yeah, that's what you do with, with loan sharks and bank yeah oh and they'll just run away and cry because that'll that'll motivate the rest of their customers to pay sure so i said then that won't fly either somebody like russia china whoever's going to bail them out in this big game well then they'll owe all their assets to those people either way the, the greeks already forfeited their assets they signed on the dot somebody before them signed on the dotted line and what i see in the nostradamus prophecy is the possibility that those people really will stand together. Remember, they're Orthodox Christians. Mm -hmm. And those people might really stand together and say no. And if that were to happen, they might, they, they might be retaliated upon for that. So anyway, to me, it's that kind of world. But so is, is that what's going on in Turkey? Turkey didn't, isn't playing ball the way they're being told, or they want to resist, or, or is it just pure spreading the, you know, I've been saying, watch out Europe, right? Didn't I? I mean, we're not claiming that they're sending uh, terrorists in with the refugees for nothing. They can't just do that and then have nothing happen or, or it's very ineffective. It's crying wolf and then you won't believe it. But to keep everybody terrorized now, it's Turkey. It was Saudi Arabia not long ago. Turkey, right? Um, didn't it, something happen in Italy, I think? Anyway, you got to watch out now in Europe for some of these things that... Um, the hostility in Hungary, right, is only escalating. And so, you know, this this stuff, as we've been watching, is on a much bigger uh, trajectory than what they're telling you about. And so what, to bring it back where we started out with the eschatological view, when you look at it from the eschatological view of either the Quran or the Judeo-Christian scriptures, you're heading toward a time of trouble never seen in the world. You're heading toward a thing we call Armageddon, they call the Malhama, uh, which is this great war. It's going to be over there by both our accounts. They, they, they have it happening near Damascus. We have it happening near Damascus. We have Damascus being destroyed in a day in our scriptures. Okay, so either the scriptures are legends, they're wrong, they're fiction, or for the people who you know come to a site like this, who are looking for to find out what do they mean, well, I don't know. What do they mean? What's going on in the world right now? Where all where is the Russian army building up? Near Damascus, aren't they? I mean, where is this great war starting to form around? So the question becomes, wow, is it really going to, are they pulling the trigger? Is it going to happen right now? Because it, it looks that way when you read the news. I mean, everything seems very hot and everybody's very tense. But I'm going to, you know, my position, Dad, is that because the seven-year covenant hasn't started yet, the eschatological viewpoint says we have a seven-year covenant that has to result in the building of the, the temple. That can't happen if, if, if they're blowing up Temple Mount, if, they're, if Damascus is destroyed, if the world war is on, that none of that's important. Uh, so, and, and this, of course, is not even to talk about the Christian point of view that we hold with the, the rapture. The raising of the dead at the Feast of First Fruits, the 40 day warning, and the fulfillment of the sign of Jonah, rapture of the church in the spring, uh, all of that. You know, and let's say that's just a, another fantasy that has to be explained on another day. You've still got Daniel. You've still got this Jewish trip with this false Messiah that's coming. And that's in the Quran, and that's to the Christian and the Jewish. Every, all the monotheists seem to understand this. In their scripture, their followers don't seem to understand it, mm -hmm. but the people of the scriptures do. So, uh, have we have we got any more time? To, I'm not going to be able to get to the the um, the article. Uh, no, I, there's. But next week, I really want to show people a different type of insight. An article that was sent to me by my friend in Hungary 
that is a, um, if you bother to look him up, Gaspar Miklos Tamas, born in 1948, is one of Hungary's most prominent intellectuals and an important political voice in Europe. Trained as a philosopher and author of numerous books and articles, he was a leading dissident in the 1980s. Remember, they were under communist rule in the 1980s. Today, he calls himself a Marxist and is very critical of Hungary's Prime Minister Viktor Orban and his nationalist ideas. And so this interview reveals this man's opinion. And when you look at this man's opinion versus this mouthpiece that I read today, this McLaughlin, this ex-CIA teacher mouthpiece saying nothing, revealing nothing about true history. And then you read this interview and you see the way this man answers the questions about uh, the history of, you know, of, of Hungary and Hungary's involvement right now, what's going on in this refugee crisis and such, but it reveals some of history. Um, much more than you'll find in any of these other articles. And this is why I wish I could have got to that today, Dad, because I, I really wanted to, people to see the difference between... Well, we, can the, we can put the link up under the program today. And yeah, well, that's... Go by and read that and be prepared for a talk on it next week. Yeah, that's, that's a good idea. But it's important, I think, to, to have this foundational idea as we watch the geopolitical landscape, that if you don't have that eschatological, you know, context, you don't have to have all the answers worked out, I don't think. But when you understand a deeper vision of history, as it, you know, in one, on one hand, and eschat eschatology on the other, what, what is predicted for these end times? What is the possible vision that we are fulfilling? Because that, and with that specifically, I mean this false deliverer of the Jews, mm -hmm. you know, because that's what brings it right to Jerusalem, right to this temple they're waiting to build, this righteous king that has to rise to to co go forth conquering and to conquer that can then break this covenant of the Jewish temple. I mean, all of these things, as we've been talking about for years, are so relevant in the modern geopolitical argument. You know, it's almost like you're not sure where one starts and the other one ends when we start talking about the political, geopolitical um, uh, tensions and natures of those tensions, say, on Temple Mount mm -hmm. or, or between Israel and Iran and, and these kind of things. These when you when you go back to what is that really got to do with? Well, it's got to do with the fact that this English empire came and said, we're going to repatriate that land with Israelites. Mm -hmm. And then they not only, you know, started with the little area that they agreed upon, but then they expanded on that and they blamed the Arabs for starting the wars. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the, and, and that's, you know, people don't commonly know that, especially Christians, because that's not part of our propaganda. But the history that I've seen, uh, I'm quite convinced because of the whole of every, uh, of everything I've seen and learned, that yes, that's the more likely understanding. That in an effort to get what they're trying to get, which is all of that land from Egypt to the Euphrates, right? I mean, that's what they imagine in this, their Talmudic view, that's what they're entitled to, mm -hmm. right? That they feel this entitlement in the, in the way of what seems to be a con, a, 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 the greatest con in history, where these people that aren't really Jews convince the Vatican to loan them money to go get that holy land from the Arabs. Um, and that seems to be the history that leads us to today. And that's the, the underlying context on which all of our modern history is built. So you look at when, you know, what did happen when the Jews went back there. They went there funded by this Rothschild sort of banking money. They went there being you know, given money to leave the countries they were at to go repopulate there. And, and what do you have reported by the Arabs of that time? That there, were, you know, there was this military push. The people that came that just wanted to live, they weren't the ones, but there was money backing a military push to keep terrorizing the neighbors to get more of their land. And that's what they rebelled against. All those early Arab rebellions, they were rebelling against this 
um, colonization, if you will. And so that's what brought about finally the, the statehood and the declaration of borders and all that. And look at how that's expanded over the years, right? And so all of those things, however you argue them, the, the net result is Israel has, you know, 700% more land than they originally said they were going to be satisfied with. And the Arabs have proxy terrorist rulers over them like Mubarak and the Kingdom of Saud and uh, Saddam Hussein Jordan. And, and Jordan's kingdom, right? This is what wound up in that region. And you can trace the money to who influenced all that. We know it was our influence, even the PLO. And so Mossad, of course, where'd they get the money? Where'd Israel, you know, where'd Mossad, where's Mossad get? Did they just start making little, you know, hummus over there in the desert when they first got there in the 40s? Mossad, hummus, Stan, we're trying to start our terrorist organization. Please come and try our hummus. So no, I mean, you know, they've been funded by America all these years. So, you know, th those historical connections can't be denied. What we have to question is how does that really relate to the modern world? You know, how is that? What What is our connection? Why do we send all that money? What are we protecting them from? They're the ones that keep gaining land, right? The Arabs aren't gaining land. The Arabs keep getting more dictators that we support, more of our guns to slaughter their own people. I mean, that's the history of it. So, um, yeah, it's... Anyway, this is the background that I'm trying to help people see, Dad, so that we can understand how we're getting closer to the context of the biblical satisfaction of the scriptures, Armageddon and, and the, the rebuilding of the temple and the, the king that's going to have to rise and be given a crown to go forth conquering and to conquer. Uh, you know, well, those... that's to save the Jews from their greatest fear, which is their which is building right now as uh, something that's called ISIS. Well, I, I still believe that's our perspective. I mean, that's my perspective. I'm, I'm not as certain of that as I am about other things. For instance, the World War III can't start next year. No, well, like we I told, have to keep watching it develop. But... Like we've been saying this year, the rapture wasn't going to happen. So, right. I mean, I hope, you know, hey, September and October ago, where's the Shemitah people? Where's the, where's the meteor people? Where's the, you know, the red moon people? Yeah, come on, September, October, Rapture, Renee M, Lindley Oz, all you big time internet providers of prophecy knowledge. Gosh darn it, I mean, I hope people, you know, come on, wake up, help, help people wake up, you know. You got to get a real understanding of the history and the scripture. And it's been very misunderstood, which is why I really encourage people to, to, to go to the Bible study. I, I think until you understand what you've misunderstood in scripture, you can't re-put together what's right about what we're talking about is interpretation. Anybody's interpretation might work for you. For instance, until you understand that the false Messiah of the Jews must be a Jew, must satisfy the Jewish requirements so they can call him the Messiah, well, then, you know, you won't be able to poke holes in the, the Obama's the Antichrist, King William's the Antichrist, you know, all the different Antichrists, the Pope's the Antichrist, all this kind of stuff that sensationalizes the story and misleads Christianity and the world, because the world then sees that and they think, well, that's what the Christians think. Christians are waiting for Obama to be the Antichrist. Yeah. Um, and, and of course it has no real basis. So if you don't study the scripture and understand really how, how misunderstood we've inherited it, then it's even harder to put the geopolitical uh, story into the, the eschatological framework, mm -hmm. right? Because you misunderstand your eschatology just like you misunderstand your, all of the scriptures. They've been misrepresented from the beginning. And that's what we're doing at Brosal on YouTube and at the Philadelphian Church is we're trying to get our uh, our study of the scriptures to, you know, we call it truth, not tradition. We're, we're looking for what does it say and how, how can we uh, how can we get confidence in the scriptures for what it says rather than what we've always been told it says. And the big message we talk about lately is the, you know, believe in Jesus or go to hell. 
Um, we've been looking through the Bible about heaven and hell and what those things really mean, what they meant to Jesus when he said it, right? And this is what I find is, is missing with the understanding of scripture on a, on a broad level in Christianity, which brings a misunderstanding of eschatology, which confuses everybody and makes this whole geopolitical thing seem like a, to me, it's like a giant circus ride, right? All these faces popping out like a Halloween ride or something, you know, to scare you. And nobody has any context to put it in. So that's all that. I'm really trying to help provide some sort of context for people. And um, next week, if we can, uh, like you said, maybe we'll, we'll post this article. And, and it's a really good interview. And I'd like to take it apart a little bit next week to see how much we learn from him about what's going on in the world and about our own perspectives being twisted, mm -hmm. right? Versus what we looked at today uh, as the mouthpiece is telling us what's going on in the world and trying to sort of undermine the headlines with something more concrete. So that's, that's nice to be back with you, Deb. Yeah, gee, it was a lot of fun. And uh, it's been a great two days of all these discussions that we've had, getting back into the uh, the real watch that we have for, you know, almost 35 years now. Uh, I think that's the basis that we can claim that I, I truly believe we know what we're talking about because we never made any assumptions. We let history develop so that the it either developed into the scriptural story or it didn't. It had to stand on its own. We said that right from the beginning. We don't have a bias. And what all this study and what all this watching has actually brought is a much broader understanding of the scriptures themselves and in what Christianity, the vein of Christianity in those scriptures. And uh, uh, to me, it's been the most exciting study, the most exciting thing that a, a person could have ever done with their lives. I mean, I've been involved in it now for 35 years. And you were just a, a young kid growing up when we started all of this, so you understand it from all of those years. Uh, and now you're sitting right here at my side when I'm getting old and really ready to carry on this message and, and show conclusively that the prophecy of Daniel played out on the stage of history and it's so obvious when you understand where to look, what to look for, and why you need to look there to see it, which is what we started out teaching those many years ago. So um, thanks a lot, everybody, for, uh, for listening. Keep listening. We want to hear your comments. Please give us all the comments you want. I think we're standing here ready to answer anything that can be thrown at us because uh, we've got the background for it. And um, the support, you want to keep getting these messages? The support has to come from you. Once again, thank you, Tony, for all the work that you put into these shows. And, and uh, we'll welcome you back next week. And until we see you then, uh, we want you all to have a great